That's right. This is the least glorious that you'll ever be. That's right. Amen? That's right. Isn't that a liberating truth? Yes, it is. Come on now. I remember when, I, when the Lord first started showing me that because I always used to think things like, you know, if I don't pray more tomorrow than I did today, then I'm backslidden. I mean, literally, that was how rigid I was with myself. If I pray two and a half hours today, but I only pray two hours and 15 minutes tomorrow, then I'm sliding backwards and I'm a backslider because I heard some molested Smith Wigglesworth quote somewhere that someone quoted out of context that sounded something like that. And so I took it to heart and I was like, you know, if I'm not more, I don't know, if I don't read more tomorrow than I read today, I'm backslidden. If I don't do more tomorrow than I did today, I'm backslidden. But the truth of the matter is there is no sliding back in this kingdom because the glory that we carry is always on the rise and it's always on the increase. And you want to know what it says in Isaiah chapter 9? It says that of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And then it says that the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. What accomplishes the increase of his kingdom? Me, my zeal, my ability to read more, my ability to pray more, my ability to do more. No, the zeal of the Lord accomplishes the increase of his kingdom. So it has nothing to do with how zealous I am. Now, yeah, sure never be lacking in spiritual zeal but the zeal i'm never lacking in is his zeal because it's only his zeal that accomplishes anything so i'm always on the increase and this glory i carry is always on the rise why because the zeal of the lord has accomplished something radical in me and i can't help but go from glory to glory because that's just who i am the book of Hebrews says that we are not of those who shrink back that's not in our nature that's not in our dna we're always increasing in glory we're we're never anything less than glorious, but this is the least glorious that will ever be because we're always on the rise and never on the decrease. Amen? Thank you, Holy Ghost. Let's pray, guys. Jesus, we love you tonight. We thank you for your kingdom. We thank you for that truth, Lord, that we are always on the rise, that we are glorious, we are glorious, we are glorious, but this is the least glorious we will ever be. Father, I thank you for that amazing reality. I thank you for that amazing truth. To be in Christ, God, it's impossible to, quote, backslide if I'm in you because you're never sliding back. You're not of those. That's not in your DNA. That's not in your nature, and so it's not in ours. And I just declare to every worried heart in this place that if you're in in Christ, you're not backslidden, and you might think you are because you might feel like you're not doing as much today as you did yesterday or whatever, but listen to me. Shake off that nonsense today and realize that in Christ, you only front slide, okay? You can't do anything but front slide. So I declare that in Jesus' name. We're eternally front front sliding, yeah? <laughs> See, this grace thing is a slippery slope, but we're always sliding forward, and uh, <laughs> I can't help but front slide. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we pray that you would just speak to us tonight out of the depths of your word. We pray that you would unveil the eternal mysteries of the gospel tonight, and I pray that our hearts and our minds would grasp it tonight, and I ask it in Jesus' mighty name, and everybody said, Amen. 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 Well, guys, it is an honor to be here with you all again tonight. Um, uh, We're going to get into this thing tonight. I got a whole mess of stuff I want to talk about tonight, and we'll see where we end up, uh, because I have no idea, okay? We will see where we get to. I was going to, I had a message kind of rolling around in my my spirit tonight that the Lord was giving me today about the judgment scene in light of the new covenant and I think we're going to hit on that next time so that should be a lot of fun so come out for that Um, maybe some cows will be tipped I don't know Um, maybe they'll be butchered maybe they'll be put between uh, two buns and we will feast on them and uh, that should be fun but tonight I'm going to talk to you about the eternal gospel the eternal gospel that doesn't mean I'm going to preach very long although I might it just means I'm going to talk to you about the eternal nature of the gospel and the eternal nature of God's plan to reconcile the human race to himself okay now, some of this stuff is stuff that we've mentioned in passing in, in other studies when I've been here, but tonight we're just going to kind of dig right in and attack this thing's jugular and uh, really go for it, okay? Yes, so, yes. Lord, we thank you. Yeah, and guys, please, you know, be in prayer for uh, my, my wife and I. We will be flying out... Uh, Thursday morning for Hawaii, and uh, we'll be preaching, ministering Sunday at a congregation there, and I had an invitation possibly to go hit another uh, congregation while I'm there. I'll see if I can do it or not, but just be in prayer for us. Our uh, kids are staying up here, be in prayer for our family, and just uh, we're just going to expect something ridiculous to happen while we're down there, man, and God to do something radical. So, amen. It's always good to know you guys are are with me. Thank you, Lord. See, there we go. (laughs) Jesus, yeah. Some said it thundered. (laughs) All right. The eternal gospel. Are you guys ready? Hey, man, I I don't know about you, but I I was talking to Shelby before. I feel like something 
I feel like something is happening. Yes. And uh, hearing the testimony tonight and all that, I don't know. I just feel like something's snapping in the spirit realm okay. right now. And, and I know it snapped 2,000 years ago, but I feel like we're getting on board with the snap yeah. here in this region. I don't know. I just feel like we're on the t- we're right at that tipping point, like something's happening. I mean, the, 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 the testimonies I've been hearing from people, the people that I've had coming to me, kind of coming out of the woodwork, people that I didn't even know grasped this message. And, you know, sometimes you feel like Elijah in the cave and you yeah. feel like you're the only one who hasn't kissed Baal or whatever, but you know what? The Lord always has those 3,000 that haven't, and I just feel like that, 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 that they're, they're coming out of the woodwork, and I'm just starting to meet people that I haven't even known that were uh, connected to this message in this area, and I feel like something's coming together, and something's about ready to snap, so you know what? Just, just buckle up, and uh, get ready for what God's going to do. I'm not yeah. like prophesying that something's going to happen tomorrow or anything, but I'm saying I think I think in the next several months we're going to see something begin to unfold, and I'm just prophesying your group's going to begin to grow like crazy, yeah. and I'm prophesying all, uh, uh, just just crazy stuff's going to start happening. So just get ready for it, guys, because we're on the, we're at the tipping point. We're on the brink of something going on. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So let's open those Bibles or our mobile devices with your Bible app on it, whatever you have. And uh, let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9. Ain't heard too many grace messages coming out of Ecclesiastes, right? But we're we're going to do our best. (laughs) Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9. We're going to talk about the eternal gospel. Thank you, Holy Ghost, for convicting us that we're wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment tonight. And and thank you, Lord, for showing us the truth about it. The Bible says that what has been will be again. Did you hear that? What has been will be again. And so I want you to understand something. Now, maybe I'm, I'm being a little bit, maybe I'm taking a little bit of liberty with this passage of scripture for the sake of bringing some prophetic truths out. But what has been will be again. I want you to understand that anything that we experience in this realm that we call time has already been somewhere else, okay? Whatever we experience in this realm called time has already been somewhere else. It's already happened in the spirit and we are just catching up with things that have already happened in the realm of eternity, okay? What has been will be again. In fact, um, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says that now faith is, or uh, you know what, let's go, verse 3, let's just go there. It says, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. You know, the visible world that we interact with with our five senses, it was created from spiritual material that predated the physical material, that the things which are seen, were they weren't created from visible things. They were created from invisible things. Yeah, so right. so the, the natural world was pulled from out of the spiritual world. So what is has already been. You understand that? Yeah, what yeah. is now has already existed in the realm of eternity. What we know now and perceive with our five senses existed before it ever entered into this realm. Do you understand that? Yeah. What has been will be again. And what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. No, not even a new covenant. There is nothing new under the sun because anything that we experience in this realm called time has already existed in the realm of eternity and it just finds itself popping into time but it's already existed before it got here. Hallelujah. Yes. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. So tonight, I just want to kind of bring some truths out of the scripture tonight about the eternal nature of the gospel. Because what we think arrived on the scene 2,000 years ago has actually existed from eternity to eternity. It's been here before we got here. It happened before it happened. It had, come on now, this gospel is eternal. The, what took place 2,000 years ago actually took place in eternity. What has been will be again. Yeah. So what happened in eternity is simply what manifested itself in time 2,000 years ago. Is there anything that c- someone can look at and say, this is something new? And the answer is no. no. It's already happened. It happened before our time. Amen. Revelations chapter 14 verse 6 says, Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. The gospel is an eternal message. The gospel did not occur in time. It happened in eternity. And eternity is more than just endless time, okay? Now, I'm just going to give you my understanding of eternity. Maybe it's flawed. Maybe you've got a better one. But this is just how I see this stuff. 
stuff. That, that, that time is measured by the rotation of planets around the sun and stuff. But listen to me. In the realm of eternity, in the realm of heaven, in the realm where God existed before earth was here, there was no such thing. There is no such thing as clock time. He exists far above the circle of the earth where time rules as master. Okay, There is no such thing as time in the realm of eternity. God exists outside of it. Okay, My understanding is that eternity is a realm. It's a world all of its own. Okay, it's, you know, our timeline is one little line of time, but eternity, God sits in the middle of it and everything shoots out from where he sits and he can access any point of history at any time. He's not limited to one slot in time. He's not limited to the century that we are limited to. He exists in all time at all times because he lives in eternity. Amen, brother. Very good. And this gospel that we believe on is called the eternal gospel because it's not something that just arrived on the scene 2,000 years ago. It's something that existed before it existed. (laughs) All right. You guys with me tonight? All right. John chapter 8, verses 56 through 59. And, And trust me, tonight the purpose of this message is not just to do a bunch of scriptural gymnastics and just try to show you a bunch of weird stuff and make you say, ooh, ah, I never thought about that before. I don't preach stuff for that purpose. I used to, but I don't care about that stuff anymore. I want to change lives and I want to change hearts. And I think what happens is, is that when we have a limited gospel, we end up with a limited God. And then we end up with a lot of questions like, why in the world did God do what he did in the first place if he knew he was if he knew it was all just going to get screwed up why did he do it that way in the first place why did he start off by making a couple naked hippies and throwing them in a garden and then he knew Adam was going to sin but yet he did it anyways and then Adam sinned and he blew it and then you know for 4,000 years he just has to send everybody to hell or something like that and it's not until 2,000 years ago that men start being saved I don't believe that by the way but that's the way a lot of popular theology goes and it's like why did God do it that way in that understanding God is just one big cosmic screw up who has first plan bit the dust and so he had to come up with another plan to fix what didn't work the first time around so Adam was the original plan and I don't believe that I'm just saying that in, in, in some people's minds Adam was the original plan but it all you know it all got messed up by some dude eating off an apple tree he wasn't supposed to be eating off of okay and so then God was like man I really thought this was gonna work I really thought my plan was gonna work man I, I really should have thought this thing out a little bit better before I executed it this way and so then he has to come he he holds some heavenly council and gets together with the four living creatures and the other members of the Godhead and they're like what are we going to do to save this mess what are we going to do to fix what What are we going to do and then Jesus is like well I got a plan maybe I'll become a human being and go and die and, and, and you can pour out all your wrath on me instead of on them and, and I'll save them and the Lord's like plan B and it sounds like a good one son let's do it and and see then you just you're left with all these questions like what in the world how did an omniscient God get it so wrong and if, if plan A failed how can we really be confident that plan B is not going to fail and and see that's just because we see the gospel in linear time but the gospel doesn't exist in linear time it exists in eternity so really in the gospel some things that we think happen second actually happen first and some things that we think happen first actually happen second and God doesn't work on the same timeline that we work on this gospel is eternal that's right. <laughs> John chapter 8, verses 56 through 59, Jesus is speaking to a group of religious Jews, and he tells them, look, if you guys were Abraham's children, then you'd be doing the stuff that Abraham did, but you don't act like Abraham because you don't believe on me, so you prove that you're really not Abraham's kids, and they get pretty upset at him about this, and then Jesus says, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. Listen to this. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. Now, Abraham lived about 430 years before the law was given. And Jesus says, Abraham, your father rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. And here you say that you don't, that you're, you're, whatever. Okay, let's just move on. Okay, you are not yet 50 years old, the Jews said to him. And you have seen Abraham. Okay, good one. You've seen Abraham. You know, Abraham saw your day and he rejoiced. And you're, you're not even 50 years old. Okay, good one, Jesus. You've seen Abraham, 58. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Yeah. Yeah. Ha, did you hear that? Yeah. Before Abraham was born, I am. He doesn't say before Abraham was, I 
was. <laughs> he doesn't say before Abraham was, you know, I was too. He says before Abraham was, I am. In other words, before Abraham was, I still am. I'm still before Abraham, and yet I'm after Abraham. And yet at the same time, I'm also still there with Abraham because guess what, Jack? I'm not stuck in time the way that you are. So before Abraham was, I still am. So you say you're not even 50 years old. You're limiting me to time. You're saying you're not even 50 and you've seen Abraham and Jesus says, I'm telling you something that's going to blow your minds. But before Abraham was, I still am. Amen. And at this, they picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple ground. Sometimes you just got to hide yourself. You know, sometimes it's not worth the debate. Sometimes it's not worth the argument. Sometimes you might just drop that bomb and then slip away and let it do its job. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) I've learned that the hard way. I've gotten in too many debates and I've gotten in too many arguments trying to prove my point to people who don't want it to be proven. And so I found the best thing to do is when people pick up stones, just slip away and let the bomb you drop do its job. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Yeah, let them deal with the fallout. Blow in, blow up, blow out. Just like the evangelist, right? See, come on now. (laughs) Jesus says, you're trying to limit my presence to physical time. But before Abraham was, I still am. And therefore, I can tell you that Abraham was, he rejoiced at seeing my day. In fact, he saw it and he rejoiced about it. And they're like, they can't wrap their minds around this truth. This just goes to prove something to us. And what it goes to prove is that the gospel is eternal. Before it ever arrived on the scene, it was declared and it was proclaimed to Abraham. And in beyond just types and shadows, it was proclaimed to Abraham because it predates Abraham. Jesus is still before Abraham at that moment in time when he wasn't even yet 50 years old. Mm -hmm. This gospel is eternal. See, what was is what will be again. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that can rightly be called new because it existed before our time. Come on now. Galatians chapter 3, verses 6 through 9, uh, Paul says, Consider Abraham. He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who believe are the children of Abraham. Isn't that what Jesus said to the the Jews? He says, look, if Abraham was your daddy, you'd act like him, but you don't. Therefore, you prove that you're not really his kids. uh, Paul says here that those who believe are the children of Abraham. Not just those who are the natural descendants, but those who have the faith of Abraham. Those are the ones who have Abraham's DNA and prove that they're really his progeny. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Romans 4, 1 through 8. What then shall we say? I'm going to blow through some of this. So some of it you may just want to pent right down and you can recheck it later because I got a I got a I got a I got, a, I got like a more than 10 round clip in this gun and uh, no matter what the religious uh, uh, elites say they ain't gonna uh, ban that uh, magazine so uh, <laughs> so we're just gonna unleash it all tonight and uh, whatever Romans 4 1 through 8 what then shall we say that Abraham our forefather discovered in this matter What matter? The matter of righteousness and about the gospel. If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. Now, what does the scripture say? It says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. When he He said, blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered, and blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against them. And what what I want you to see is that these two guys, Abraham and David, both caught on to the gospel before it ever arrived in time. The Bible says that God, you know, the scriptures, he sees the gospel before it ever arrives. Before the gospel ever shows up in physical time, they already have it. In fact, Abraham reaps the benefits of it, and he lives as a righteous man before the blood of Jesus was ever shed in linear time. David sees the benefits of the new covenant, and I believe accessed them 
Even before the blood of Jesus was ever shed in natural time. Now these are like the men who go into the promised land, land and bring back the fruit before the whole nation ever entered into it. They yeah, went yeah, and yes. they bring back the grapes and they're like, look at what is coming our way. Look at what's in the future for us. Look, they went and they had a foretaste of it. They quote, taste the powers of the coming age in that sense. And they bring it back and they show a generation what's coming under a new and better covenant. But all that goes to show us is that the land was already there and it was already rich with fruit and milk and honey and all that stuff before it ever showed up in time. Abraham accessed it. David had an understanding of it because the gospel is an eternal gospel. And what is, is that which has already been. And there's nothing new under the sun. It happened before we ever got here. Yes. All right now, you guys still with me? Galatians chapter 3 verses 15 through 18 says, Brothers, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scriptures do not say and to his seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, singular, meaning one person, who is Jesus Christ. So the Abrahamic covenant is not with a whole nation of people. God makes a covenant with Abraham out of time, but the covenant was to Abraham's, it was with Abraham's seed, not with his seeds. It was a covenant with Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? Yes. And so when you hear guys, and look, I I don't want to rip on anybody and there's a lot of opinions about this and you are entitled to whatever opinion you want to have. But let me just tell you, I get bothered when I hear people stand up and prophesy doom and gloom over America because a man who sits in a swivel chair in an Oval Office does something wrong to Israel. Do I think we should do wrong stuff to Israel? I don't know. It depends on what they're doing. (laughs) But Israel is no longer a covenant nation because that covenant does not exist anymore. That covenant disappeared. The glory on Moses' face is no longer shining. So the promise, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you, that was a promise to Abraham. Singular. And Abraham's seed, Jesus Christ, and those who are of him. It's not about a nation. It's not about land and it's not about lineage. It's not about real estate. You're helping me. Come on now, friend, because we get this stuff and we're like, oh, man, we, we divide the land. God's going to send earthquakes and he's going to send, send floods and fires and famines. And all that causes us to do is live in this state of fear and paranoia. And we always think we're about ready to taste the backside of God's hand. But that's not really what's going on. Don't fall for that junk. Don't fall for it. God has nothing but blessings for us. Amen. Amen. Well, we think we're going to get the back of his hand. He's actually just trying to embrace us. But because we've been, we've been you know, uh, filled with all this fear-mongering nonsense, when he comes to embrace us, we think he's coming to judge us. Mm. And like Jesus says to Jerusalem, how long, I, you know how long I've tried to gather you to myself? I want to gather you under my wings, under the mercy seat, wanting to show you mercy, wanting to bring you into this new covenant reality and rest. I've been trying to do this for years, but you keep stoning my prophets and killing those I send to you. You keep slapping my hands away when all I'm trying to do is love you. Because you mistook, you, you misunderstood what I was trying to do. Anyways, I'm getting off track here. I got to get back on what I'm talking about. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture did not say and to his seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. What I mean is this. The law, which was introduced 430 years after that covenant, does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on a promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. So again, I want you to see that the covenant that we are a part of was accessed by Abraham 430 years before the Mosaic law was even given. And it's the very covenant that we are a part of today. Now, does that mean that we're a part of the Abrahamic covenant or does it mean that Abraham was a part of a covenant that existed outside of his time and exists outside of our time, but we're both in that same covenant because it's an eternal covenant. And that's exactly what it meant because God made the promises to Abraham and to his seed, meaning Jesus Christ. So the covenant, yeah, it's with Abraham in that time, but it was also with Jesus Christ. And the covenant made with Jesus Christ is a covenant that was made before let there be light was even spoken, folks. Come on now, check this out. Luke chapter 22, verse 20, Jesus at the Last Supper, whatever you want to call it, 
Likewise, he also took the cup after, cup after supping, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. So the new covenant is where? In my blood, right? The new covenant, Jesus says, this is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. You get that? The new covenant is in the blood of Jesus. When his blood is shed, no covenant is inaugurated without the shedding of blood. The Mosaic covenant is inaugurated with the shedding of blood. Moses sprinkles blood, right? Because covenants come into play when blood is shed. And God just made it that way to... For a reason, but, 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 but check this out now. Because when was Jesus' blood shed? Well, it was shed in linear time 2,000 years ago. But Revelation 13, 8 says that Jesus Christ was the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world, from before the foundations of the world, from before creation, Jesus was the lamb who was slain. Now, now, now. Come on now. Now, a slain lamb bleeds, right? Yes. And if the lamb was slain before creation and the new covenant is in Jesus' blood, that means the new covenant existed before creation. Well, my goodness. <laughs> Come on now. But it's not until that blood is shed in time that it becomes accessible to all. Yes. But men get peaks behind the curtain. Men get taken into the promised land and get to bring back fruit before all men are introduced to it. But listen to me, the lamb is slain before creation, but it's not until that lamb's blood is shed in time that all men get in on it. But the covenant existed before creation. Therefore, before there was a fall, there was an answer to the fall. Before there was a problem, there was a solution. Before there was sin, there was forgiveness. Before there was a sickness, there was healing. Do you get this, guys? The problem was solved before it was even a problem. Amen. <laughs> Come on, brother. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 says that the law is only a shadow. Now, Hebrews chapter 10, those of you who know this passage, what is Hebrews chapter 10 talking about specifically? Is it talking about the law as far as thou shalt and thou shalt not? Or is it talking about sacrificial laws? It's talking about sacrifices, right? Read Hebrews chapter 10. It's all about sacrifice. It's all about the sacrificial system and the shedding of blood. So the law in question here, yeah, it's talking about the whole law, but specifically in this instance, it's talking about the laws concerning and pertaining to sacrifice and the shedding of blood under the old covenant. Okay? Okay. Check this out. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. Okay, the Bible says that the laws concerning sacrifices are a shadow. They were a shadow of good things that had not yet arrived when they were given. They weren't the realities themselves. Now, let me ask you a question. Is it possible for something to have a shadow if there's no substance? No. I can't have a shadow if I'm not here. That's right. If I'm not born yet, my adult shadow is not going to be here on the floor. Right? I cannot have a shadow unless I already exist. Okay? Now, the Bible says that the sacrificial system was a shadow. What does that mean? But that the ultimate sacrifice already existed. It says that these sacrifices were shadows, not the realities. That means that the reality already was reality. Yeah. It says, <laughs> it says, good Lord. I love this, man. I love this gospel. This stuff will make you crazy. I'm telling you what, the Bible says <laughs> the law is only a shadow of the good things that were coming, not the realities themselves. So I want you to understand something that the laws concerning sacrifice and the shedding of blood, it was a shadow of a reality that already existed, but it says they were shadows of the good things that were coming. That means that under the old covenant, you saw the shadow of a reality that already existed. It just had not made its way into time yet. It was still coming. Yeah, you understand? Yeah. It was making its way from eternity into the timeline. Yes. But in the meantime, we were left with the shadow. That's why we had a sacrificial system. Right. See, I've often heard it preached that Moses gives the sacrificial system because God, you know, Moses goes up to the Lord with like the, you know, God's got the menu and Moses has got the little pen and paper. And he's like, what can I do for you, Lord? And the Lord's like, I want goats and I want blood and I want bulls and I want doves and I want lambs and this is what I want. I want blood and I want sacrifice. See what you can do about it. And then after about, you know, 1500 years under this law system, God's like, man, this just is not satisfying me. I need something better than this. I need something better than animal's blood. I need the blood of my perfect son. And then Jesus goes and he offers his 
blood as a perfect unblemished sacrifice. And the father's like, that finally satisfies my craving. And so we talk about the sacrifice of Jesus as though Jesus is just fulfilling old covenant prophecy. That Jesus comes in response to old covenant prophecy and Jesus is just doing what the law demands. But the truth is, the law was shadowing what Jesus had already done. The reason animals had to be slain was because Jesus was slain before the shadows ever got here. And a shadow is always, I mean, if I'm looking at your shadow, it's, it's flat, it's, it's odorless, it's tasteless. I mean, it's just black and it's, sometimes it's bigger than you and sometimes it's smaller than you and sometimes it's longer than you. And I can't really tell what I'm looking at, but when I see you, all of a sudden the shadow makes sense. And so we look at the sacrificial system and we're like, why lambs? Why bulls? Why goats? Why all of this stuff? It doesn't really make any sense until you see what Jesus did in eternity and then the shadow makes sense to you. But you got to see the substance before you can understand what the shadow is all about. But we're trying to judge the substance by the shadow instead of the shadow by the substance. 